Welcome back, everybody, to Beyond the Buckets. Another terrific, fantastic guest, uh, Robert Scher. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, uh, you are the CEO of all CEOs because you are a coach to so many. Um, so, you know, before we get started, why don't you give us some context about uh, about who you are, how you got to where you're at right now, and, and CEOs. Sure. So, you know, born and raised out here in the East Bay, California, San Francisco Bay Area, and um, got involved in business early on. Had a father that was very entrepreneurial and um, always thought business was my game, undergraduate degree in business. But early on, just got involved and was one of four partners that started a business from scratch with our own money. Um, you know, I was working my way through college. We all pitched in as we could. We went through, I don't know how many downturns. This is over 23 years, a company called Bentley Publishing Group mm -hmm. published artwork like that picture behind me there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, scrapped our way through it. Uh, I got my graduate degree in business. Uh, business is fun for me. It's just like the ultimate challenge. You can never get it perfectly right. There's mathematical stuff. There's weird people stuff, right? Organizational stuff. It just keeps coming at you and it kept me really excited. So we grew that business over 23 years up into midsize. And, uh, and then about 14 years ago, I exited and decided to become a, a CEO coach. And I learned about that because I'd been in a group of other peers and we helped each other. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and learned so much, but I also learned that I was pretty good at listening and remembering and learning the game of business and then, and then helping people, right. And figuring out how do I pass on that information? How do you put things together? And I thought, well, you know, I'll give that a try. And, uh, and here we are 13, 14 years later, uh, doing just that. And uh, it's, it just turned out that my sweet spot was this sort of mid-sized business, you know, when, because I'm a process guy. I can be scrappy, but I like process and getting things organized. And mm -hmm. that's what mid-sized businesses have to do, get past the complete scrappy A stage. And then, okay, who's going to do what? How should we do it? What's going to be efficient? Okay, let's move on. And uh, that's been my spot. I love it. And we're going to take a real deep dive into how you actually coach other CEOs. But uh, before we start that, why don't you give us a fun fact about yourself that people um, that maybe know you uh, might not even know about? Well, you know, so I'll give you a fun one that I'm doing right now. And it's, uh, it's growing things. And, you know, I, I work too much, but I've always enjoyed getting outside in the backyard and grew up and, you know, doing a lot of that sort of thing. So I'm trying to grow some winter vegetables right now out in the back and I'm doing a terrible job of it. They got about this high and not getting much higher right now. Yeah, Maybe It's me, you know, who knows, but it's fun to just get out there and get some exercise and fool around a little bit. So my kids are starting to call me farmer Rob and, uh -huh. and that's okay. And I'm getting a few growing gifts and this and that and the other. So there's a fun fact. Uh, maybe you can blame it on our climate change for uh, the the lackluster uh, vegetable garden you're developing. Totally not my fault. That's right. <laughs> I am blameless. <laughs> so tell me how you coach uh, CEOs. Um, you know, as a as a coach myself, as well as a CEO, um, I just you know I see the value in having somebody with a lot of expertise kind of pinpoint some of the things that you may uh, be able to do better. And it's not necessarily restructuring. I would, and these are, these are only my words. Uh, I would say it's just pinpointing some areas of improvement because we all want to optimize and, and become our, whether our best selves or our best team or our, our best business. Um, so tell me how you convince other CEOs to get coached by you and your firm. So um, I, I don't convince many of them, right? There, there's a, a, a few who say, I would rather have a higher performing business and get it right faster mm -hmm. than have to figure it out and learn it the hard way through trial and mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the ideal client. They're like, I wish I had the smartest idea at the start of all the time and I had all the experience in the world, but uh, I'm willing to listen to somebody to give me a shortcut. Coaching is a shortcut. There's a lot of people that can get where they want to get without coaching. It just takes them an extra few years. Sure. So, you know, one is that burning desire to run a better organization. So that's the first part. So a lot of times I'm not convincing them. They're frustrated, mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. They've tried different paths. CEOs are not um, 
people that you know sort of wait for problems they're always striving and like how do we how do we get there faster right. so that's the first thing the second thing i think is that i have sat in their seat right i've run a business i've gone through most of those struggles so my outlook often is what would i do if i were in that person's seat right and that's a place of humility it's not like you should do what i tell you to do right. it doesn't work well on any humans to actually no. but gosh if i were confronted with that i might try this so that's that's one approach and it's it's not about best practices it's about me listening to their situation, me listening to their desires. Not every CEO wants to be the biggest, richest man in the world or a person in the world, right? Some just want to have a tamer business that puts out enough money to live comfortably. That's totally okay, right? Some people want to have just a wonderful place to work. And if they make less money, that's fine. It's not me to judge what they should want, right? So you have to listen to what the client really wants. And then you say, now, how do I help them solve the puzzle, right? And what's holding them back? So there's, there's a couple of, of real nuggets in there. I, I think another element is that um, every one of our clients are smart and successful. Mm -hmm. They're not perfect in every way. And it's really important when you're coaching someone is to say, wow, you are awesome in this way. It's called validation and awesome in that way. And, and yet you're not getting where you want. Hey, let's look at this third area. Maybe there's something there, right? And you start with where they are. Um, you make sure they feel good about who they are and what they're trying to do, and then add some value. Um, I guess the last point I'll make, and then I'll pause, is that some people want to become the best CEO in the world, and they're willing to work on their weaknesses, and they'll just do whatever it takes to be as well-rounded and as perfect an athlete as they can. Those are fun people to work with, love it. There's other people who are like geniuses, say a genius entrepreneur, but hates mm -hmm. management and the boring meetings and all that stuff. Right. Sometimes you have to assess what do they really want? And you know what? If they just want us to help them build a team that does the boring management stuff and they can just come up with innovations one after another, right. that's not a bad thing, that's okay. It doesn't make them a bad client and occasionally, we have clients that say, look, you help me in this way. I want you to be my permanent coach. You're not going to train me and then leave right. because you help me think things through or you help keep me accountable, whatever they might want. So the notion that a coach fixes a person and then finishes with them isn't always what the client wants. Right. A couple of things that you touched, touched on, um, you know, like you said, everybody's going to be a little bit different in their approach. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, in any profession, you can either really enjoy what you're actually doing. Do you want to be a lawyer or do you want to be a famous lawyer? Because there's success in both. Do you want to be a, a, an athlete or a famous athlete? Do you want to be a, a CEO or a famous CEO? Or, you know, there's, there's going to be different strokes for different folks. And, in that same token, both are successful and, it, and you made a great point. It's to whatever their needs are or whatever they choose and they want to do as far as, you know, what, what their business is concerned. And I think that's a, I think that's a really good point, uh, point to make because you don't have to be, um, you know, you don't have to be on the New York Stock Exchange to be a really viable, great company. Um, and you don't need to be on TV like Zuckerberg or, you know, any of the top tech, the tech CEOs, um, especially in this area. Um, and I just think that's, that, that's an important, important token for, uh, for people to understand. Yeah. A lot of paths to success. Success is personal. And, you know, our job as coaches is to help them get where they want to go and, and sometimes where they can go. So, I know you're big into basketball and even 40 years ago, if you tried to make me into a really great basketball player, I would have failed, right? Cause I'm terrible at the game. Sure. I retired from basketball in junior high. So, um, so that's another tricky part about coaching is sometimes you get someone with aspirations that don't match their capabilities. Mm. CEO wants to do something. They don't have nearly enough money to ever get there. Mm. Those can be hard conversations to kind of get to the truth of it and right. say, well, I know your dream's not quite going to fit, but hey, what about dreaming about something here? Helping them find a better spot can be part of it too. 
Exactly. Are you are you utilizing your gifts, talents and abilities in the appropriate way? And then you can have a coach uh, like yourself or myself on the basketball court, put them in a better situation so they can actually be successful for themselves as well as benefit the entire group. That's right. I could be an amazing spectator, for example, in a basketball game. <laughs> um, you know, funny story. I had one, uh, one of our early clients, amazing entrepreneur, six-time CEO. He grew this company to about $40 million, and we were helping him build, build in those processes. But he kind of fought it all along the way. Mm -hmm. He finally sold the business for a bunch of money. And on the last lunch I had with him across from his headquarters, he said, you know what, Rob? You really helped me get the process right for this business. But I got to tell you, I don't like this bigger size. It's, it's no fun. Mm -hmm. Next business I start, I'm going to grow to 10 million and sell it and then start another one because I'm amazing from zero to 10 million. Mm -hmm. And it's pure fun for me and I get to be myself. And I think I'll make more money if I just keep building businesses to 10 million and flipping them than trying to get one bigger. It was a powerful aha for John and mm -hmm. one that he's followed through on. Well, it's a, it's a good lesson for all of us as far as uh, self-awareness, because, you know, knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're bad at, you know, it's the, the easier, the quicker that you're able to identify that is going to allow you to really thrive, you know, and instead of, you know, focusing on uh, 10 different things, maybe you need to focus on one, but there are people that can focus on 10 different things. But if that's not in your wheelhouse, then why even spend the time to do that, put other people in places, get protocols in place so that it frees you up to do what you're really good at. Um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm very good at doing multiple things. You know, mm -hmm. now, obviously, while I'm doing one of them, I can't put my other attention on any of those other things, but I'm able to have a, a wide range of things on my plate where I can really manage. Um, whereas, you know, I have some really good friends that are, that are business people themselves, and they can only focus on that one thing. But that's where their lane is. I would be, if I only had to focus on one thing, my type of personality just wouldn't work. You know, that's kind of the reason why we started this podcast is because I couldn't just sit there and do one thing. Um, yeah. I have to do multiple things to keep me charged and going. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. So uh, tell me about the three pillars. I know the three pillars of your organization, um, you know, are derived from leadership, business skills, and then interpersonal relationships. Um, so why don't you explain those three to, uh, to, the, to the listeners? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's areas that we found uh, we're pretty powerful in. So sometimes we have clients that need to increase their business acumen, right? They don't know what a current ratio is. They don't know the technical, there's a lot known about how to manage and lead, right? How do you form a team and create good team bonds? Well, we don't have to figure that out. So that's just flat business acumen on the one side, right? All that B-school stuff, but made in a way that people can absorb it. Um, then there's, there's leadership styles. Leadership, again, a lot's known about it. Hey, coronavirus hits. What's the role of the leader to speak to their team? Even now, when so many teams are worn out, from dealing with coronavirus and a terrible year and all the angst that, that people have, right? What, what should a leader do to make them feel better? Hey, what if you've got four people who are, who are amazing producers, but this past year has been tough. They're, they're disappointed in themselves because their three little kids are home all the time. Mm -hmm. they, they got no childcare. They're used to working long, you know, long days, they got age, you know, all this stuff, right? How do I manage them? Do I tell them I'm disappointed? Do I tell them it's okay? Right. So these are all the kinds of leadership challenges that that we help with. We had one great client um, that, that came to us when he was the number two in his organization, found out that the founder had pancreatic cancer, six months to live. Hmm. He was like, how do I, I'm the number two guy. I know I'm going to be the number one guy, but I got to message this, but the founder is still there. And you know, it was just angst, right? Personal angst. So that's leadership, uh, leadership skills by and large. Um, and then there's, there's interpersonal skills. Management is personal. Leadership is personal. And if I've got someone on my team who's kind of ADD and high energy all the time, how do I interact with them in a way that works for them? If I've got an engineer, I'm thinking of one client's engineer. This guy never says anything. You ask him a question, you get two words back. Okay, how do we work with that guy? There's interpersonal skills that are really, really important. And so three, three areas that we tend to help out in. Where have you seen leadership fail the most? 
Wow, that's interesting. I don't know that I that I could give you a sort of a, a scientific answer around that. Mm -hmm. I think the riskiest area is when leaders either accidentally or purposefully aren't clear about, about their commitments or uh, either choose not to be clear or just accidentally aren't clear. And then people perceive that they do not deliver upon them. We're at bonus time of the year, right? And so too often we see leaders who say, oh, I'm gonna do this bonus, I'm gonna give you a piece of equity that talk about it, but then it never turns into something crystal clear. And then at the end of the year, someone thinks they're deserving of it, but then they don't really get it or they got to ask for it or it, it morphs a little bit. And that's the fastest way to take amazing leaders and lose them. Hmm. And, uh, and so that's, that's the one that comes to mind right now. And it's not just evil, unethical leaders who tell you something and then choose not to deliver. It can be really good people who who just let it slip by, right? right. Uh, the human mind can change perspectives and you really need someone you can say, sure, I'll do that. And you can kind of lose that over the course of a year and not remember kind of what you conveyed, um, but the person who's expecting it doesn't. So that's, that's my warning zone for today. Right. When I look at leadership, um, you know, we've had some, we've kind of had a couple of leadership consultants on here that have, uh, that have really, you know, taken a deep dive into that. And one of the things that I've come up with is, you know, just the authentic uh, communication. So in the event that, you know, you may have said that these bonuses were going to come out, you may have to fall on your sword and say, hey, it don't stand by those 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 uh, ideas that you had, you know, six months ago, you know, because your ideas can change uh, just like your viewpoints or just like the clothes that you wear on your back, like the things that we're wearing today, we might not want to wear in six months or two years or, or whatever the case. So um, being able to fall on your own sword and letting everybody know and showing that vulnerability, hey, I was wrong. I really messed up. You know, if you if you look at our uh, in the state of California, when, um, you know, the the our leaders are actually doing the things that we we aren't supposed to. But when we see them do it and then them make excuses about it, then we then we were kind of look at it and I'm a little sideways as far as, you know, hey, you told us this was this is this was the mandate for our entire state and you guys are doing the exact opposite thing. Um, you know, had they come out and said, you know what, from the jump, hey, you know, or just not even done it, but it just 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 showing that vulnerability a little bit more, I think is is important to leadership. If you want to keep everybody because you're not going to be perfect, you're not going to be undefeated. But I do think that if you are forthright with everybody, it will ease things and make them a little bit better. So people can understand. So I agree with that completely. And you know, you got to be vulnerable. And when you screw up, you got to admit it. But imagine this, I say, hey, I've got this new game, Chris basketball. And you get two points for some stuff, a point for this, three points for various things. You know, don't worry about it. And, and there's certain things are fouls, but, you know, let's talk about it. Okay, you got it. Good. So I tell the whole team that, right? And say there's a $50,000 prize at the end of the game. And, and then during the game, there's some scorekeeping kind of going up. But then the game's finished and you're like, we won. And I go, Actually, you know, I realized it wasn't a very way, good, good way of doing the scoring. So the three pointers are two pointers and, and I'm changing this and that bad news, Chris, so sorry. Um, you didn't win the other team won, but, but, you know, I apologize for not being clear. That's just not cool. Yeah. An apology does not make it then. Sure. And so when we make a deal with someone and we make a commitment and that's what a bonus is, that's what many things in life are. We have to be clear. And you know what, if I'm putting out an incentive for you and I don't think about it very well and I do a sloppy job, that doesn't mean I get to then take it away from you. Sure. So I would argue writing makes it real. I'm going to lay down the point system for basketball and the rules of the game. I suspect they're written, right? And then that's what we're going to go by. And if we need to change them, okay, we're going to change them for the next season. We're not going to surprise you. And so leaders have to be clear that they have to be consistent and they have to be honorable. And if that goes away, you won't keep a great team around you. Mm. Very good points. Um, I just think 
think to the own, my own business that I run <clears throat> and uh, you know, sometimes you can get in the moment and say, Oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to do this or take care of this. And you know, the only times that things have gotten sticky is if we didn't have it in writing, it wasn't a, it wasn't a firm, um, if it wasn't a firm agreement in writing, it may have been verbal. We may have forgot, forgotten what we have, we talked about. And that's the only times I've really had issues with, you know, people that I've been dealing with as far as employees or contractors or anything like that. So um, that is a very, very good point. And you know what I'd say to all of our listeners is whether you're the boss or not, if you have that verbal exchange and we talk about, okay, we're going to do this way. And so I'll get $10 bonus for whatever thing I do. And I don't get it from the boss within a day. You know what you can do? Hey, boss, um, just wanted to confirm our conversation just to make sure I'm clear. I think you said it was 10 bucks for every one of these, but we're not doing this and we are doing that. Just want to make sure if, if this is correct, awesome. If I've got it wrong, please let me know. Right. Okay? And you do it in a gentle way. That's great. And if the boss is good, he'll hit reply or she'll hit reply and go, bingo, that's it. You don't need a contract. It's just gets it down there. And then nine months later, when you're not sure what you agreed on, you go, well, I think we put, hey, we made an email note on that. Dig it up. Hey, look at that. And most, most bosses will then go, oh, that's what I said, then that's what I'll do. So that little, that little change, that little bit of clarity can come from anybody. Definitely. And that's leadership. And, and leadership doesn't have to come just from the top. It can come from inside the organization as well. You know that uh, better than anybody. Um, so uh, moving on just a little bit, uh, you, you are a, a two-time published author. You have uh, two books that are out there right now um, and working on your third. So the first two would be uh, Mighty Mid-Sized Companies and then uh, this be The Feel of the Deal. So why don't you explain those books and uh, you know why they're pertinent to organizations specifically in that mid-sized tier? Yeah, so The Feel of the Deal was the first one. It chronicles my third acquisition in Bentley Publishing Group. And I just learned so much and it was so fun. It was like a fresh eyes, like, holy cow. And it tells the story of what I learned and some basics around acquisitions. And it's really mid-sized when you get big enough to say, hey, we could grow by buying that company and grow 50%. And so um, that's what it's really about. It's a great primer if you're thinking, should I acquire? What would that be like? I don't know anything about it. It's a great book. It's on Amazon. Second one is called Mighty Mid-Sized Companies. And it's a research-based book. So we got more sophisticated in our approach. And... We actually went and interviewed about 110 different companies looking for the things that kill the growth of mid-sized companies, right? What is, you know, why is it that so many businesses get stuck at 10 million or 50 million or 100 million and, uh, and identified seven different growth killers. And, you know, mid-sized is like teenage years. It's not the same as when you're a little kid and it's not the same when you're full grown. Right. There's something unique about it. And the book really looked to find the things that hurt mid-sized companies uh, the, the worst and, and what to do about it. So what goes into, uh, obviously you're passionate about it and you've lived, uh, you lived, you know, that specifically in your own life. So you, you're able to discuss it, but what goes into writing, uh, writing a publication like this? Um, how, how long does it take? You know, is there, a, is there a full brainstorming process? Did you do it incrementally um, when, you, when you felt motivated or did you kind of just knock it all out in, in a couple of months? What was your process like? Interesting. Well, it was different for each book. The first book is really my story. So I got up at 5 a.m. every morning for six months and wrote it, wrote my story essentially. And I'm a strong writer, so I had some light editing around it. Um, it was discipline. There was a purpose for it because when you run your own business and then you want to be credible as a consultant, if you've got a book and people can read how you think, you're more likely to get clients. And I got clients from that book. So I uh, went through it. I self-published it. And so, you know, six months to write it, a couple of months to get it self-published and shipped in from Korea. Um, and then the hardest part of any book is to get it out there. Even a book publisher doesn't get it out there. So you got to promote it, put it out there, find audiences for it. A uh, second book, I decided to be and, research based. And, and hold on one second. Uh, you know, how, how did you promote it? How did you market it? 
um, because the the book industry is 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 very saturated. But how did you get that get that out there to the people? Well, that first book, I didn't do a terribly good job of it. It was funny. I, it was my first book, but I didn't have much of a network because I was a brand new consultant. I wrote that book while I was still employed as a CEO for Bentley Publishing Group. And so it was work. So I did talks, you give it out at talks, you get it on Amazon, even on Amazon, like people don't just discover books, they have to bring them to it. Right. And so I worked as best I could, I sent some out, but my network was very small. But I also, another mistake I made was that I wrote a book about acquisitions, but I wasn't really focused on being an acquisitions coach. I've got that experience. I've helped some clients through it. I thought maybe I would, right? But I wasn't sure what direction my coaching and, and consulting business would go. But it turned out that that wasn't that direction. So, you know, big lesson learned. You have to think if you're writing a book to use as thought leadership, it should align well with your experience and what you're going to deliver to clients because it's part of the thought leadership program where you know you write a book, the book goes out in speeches, people read the book, they're like, wow, I want help from that guy, right, or a person, and, and then they call you up. But if they read the book and it's not about what you do, there's a disconnect there. Mm. Now, not everybody writes books to drive business. Some people write books because they wanna share. They're emotional, they're personal. I, I write books to share my area of expertise, Right. So there is some altruism in that a lot of people read the book, get a lot of value and never pay me a nickel. So mm -hmm. that's, you got to be ready for that. But some small percent say we want to talk to the author. Right. And we want to hire the author. And so th that uh, I hope that answers your question on, on that. It does. <clears throat> and so book number um, two, you switched your strategy. I did. So I wanted to make it research based. I got a coach, by the way, the thought leadership coach who Ooh. helped me think this through and align it better. Get tremendous value. He's still a good friend today and I still work with him today. Um, we decided to make it research-based. I know a lot about mid-sized companies. I'd had, I don't know, 120 clients by then. But when you really go with research, it's a much more powerful read. You have more stories. There's more validity to it. So we interviewed over the course of a year, 110 companies. So wow. we recorded those, we transcribed it. You take the transcription and you say, what are the lessons here? And you cook it down into something, you know, two, three, four pages. And you do that enough. And then at some point you say, what patterns am I seeing? Oh, I've got seven examples that, that, um, that having a, a dysfunctional leadership team really killed them. Hmm. Okay, maybe that's a chapter. And I've got examples of what those companies did to overcome it. So the research goes out first. You find what you can prove from your own experience, but also from the research. And then you start to craft your, your argument. What is the advice I would give to someone? Uh, and I've got proof here in terms of stories. And so then, you know, you've got to write it chapter by chapter. You always write to an outline. So, you know, what's my overarching message? What are the key clumps? And then you've got to tell your story through it uh, and, and go through that. So with the research base, I have a lot more connections. I was a plus years into my consulting practice. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people had helped me in that research um, and it was a more powerful book. And so I was able to do a lot more speaking on it. Um, I got some PR built around it that helped build some credibility. <coughs> I got the seven HBR articles online, one for each chapter that helped build credibility. And, uh, and then I also had, uh, with some help from my coach, gotten that Forbes, the Forbes column. So the Forbes column helped me get a, 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 um, a book promoter, right? Who then found me a publisher. So it's, it's, a, it's a ladder of things that you develop and books uh, help you get powerful speaking positions, which help you get in front of the right audiences, right? And make those connections. And so that's what Mighty Midsize has really done for us. Beautiful. And were the were the stories uh, more anecdotal from your personal perspective or secondhand or thirdhand or all of the above? I know a lot of the books that I've been reading, um, the, the some of the stories will be, you know, anecdotal from a personal perspective. And then the others will be, you know, while working with so-and-so or, you know, uh, a story about somebody that had gone through something similar. 95% of the stories in the book 
are stories from other people's businesses. Either they were clients that gave me permission to share their aha, their what they've learned, mm. or from the research. Very little was my own. So I ran mm. a business. It was a fine business. It was one flavor of business. There's so much diversity in businesses and so many different circumstances that my own experience is just a little sliver, sliver of that. And as a coach and consultant, I learn. I mean, there isn't a week that goes by where I don't talk to one CEO and say, you know, I talked to another client two days ago. He told me about this. It was an awesome move. It might work for you. There's a lot of this sort of bringing things together. And, uh, and that's an advantage you have when you're a coach is you're not just coaching one person. You're learning from how everybody else learned and developed and bringing that to your client. Right. No, I, I see a lot of parallels as far as uh, business as well as athletics. You know, you're trying to take all these experiences that you've either seen firsthand or have witnessed somebody else go through. And you also want to get that you want to get that information from that other person because it could help you out later on in a situation or it can help somebody else out because of the information exchange. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a beautiful, beautiful process. And the other, the other part that I really enjoy is um, <clears throat> so many people want their, the first, like your first book, for instance, you probably wanted it to be a bestseller, right? And because of the because of your process, you figured out, hey, there's there needs to be another way for me to go about this a second time around. And so the second time around was probably more successful. But then those people probably even went back and got your first version as well. And you know, then you're 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 getting clients to uh, well, you're sustaining your clients over and over because of your patience and uh, patience is something that uh, obviously our society does not uh, does not favor but the people that are patient the people that keep on going learning from the mistakes that they made in the past end up ultimately winning and uh, I think that's a goal that we all want yeah and I think you know that that's true and that aligns with thought leadership so this notion about being an expert and putting content out, you know, I, I wish everything I did had, you know, thousands of people coming, but I'm speaking to a niche market, mid-sized company CEOs. There's not, that's not everybody in the world. And so um, it takes patience. Um, I, I'm on the verge of signing a client that, ha that I've known for 10 years. They've been on my webinars, they've been following me, various things, but they're finally at the point of saying, okay, we need some help. Boy, that takes patience. But it builds, and the more people that get value from reading an article, value from reading a book, right? It works its way out there, and then it starts to ping back. And, and honestly, I wish I could tell everyone who's listening, you can make all this money from writing a book. Usually, you don't. <laughs> Usually, you don't. And thanks, thanks you know, for letting me know before I start doing it. <laughs> yeah, if That's you're published by somebody else, you get a little teeny royalty. If you're self-published, you know how do you really get it out there? So. If you're, if you're writing a book for your ego or to make a mint, that's usually not it. And I'm not saying that a few don't, but we write books to deliver real value and to allow people to discover the value that we have as coaches and consultants so that they call us, right? And what really is satisfying is when someone picks up the phone and says, I've read your book, we've done two or three things from it, but we want some help around this, right? And you're like, wow, I've already helped them dramatically. And in my world, at least, it doesn't, doesn't take very many clients to give you a call, some of which need a lot of help. And so it's really about giving away a lot of help and those people that are ready for it, who want a shortcut, they want the expert on their case focused on their business. That's where you get most of the gain in professional writing and professional books. Wow. Uh, great insight because uh, I've been thinking about writing a book and just trying to figure out, you know, which direction you want to go. Um, probably a lot of it would be uh, just self-therapy, just to, to put your thoughts on paper and um, or on a computer and, and just, you know, discuss some things that are passionate or a passion for you. So um, yeah. definitely got me thinking. And when I start, I'll let you know, and uh, maybe you can help coach me. Yeah, we'll talk uh, through it, right? Write the book in the right way for the right audience for what you're trying to achieve. You got it. 
it, definitely. Uh, you uh, you contribute to a lot of online publications. You talked about Forbes. You talked about Harvard Business Review and CFO Magazine and others. Um, how did you, have, number one, have you always been a, a really proficient writer? And number two, um, <clears throat> how did you get involved with, uh, you know, being a curator for those for those great publications? Right. So, yeah. So writing started in high school. I was on the newspaper, school newspaper, became editor of the school newspaper. It's a skill. It developed early on mm -hmm. uh, and I enjoy it. And writing for me helps me organize my thoughts as well. So when I've written a piece, it just burns it in in some fashion. So that is definitely a strength that I would encourage anyone who uh, is young and wants to really build a skill. Strong writers are rare. And, uh, and, and it's tricky to make your money from being a writer, but it's a powerful tool in almost every career. So, so yes, no, I wrote for trade journals in, during Bentley Publishing Group time, right? I always was able to do that, always did that, got the name of the company out and so on. So that's always been a strength. Um, it was really um, before I published my second book, when I got that thought leadership coach and the thought leadership coach said, you know, it's, it's about, uh, you got to build a foundation. And if you want to get a great publisher, the first thing they're going to say is, well, how are you going to get the book out there? Because they want the author to get the book out there. And they're going to say, well, how big is your following on social media? How many people do you know? And if the answer is not too many, they're going to be like, well, why do I want to invest in your book if you're not going to connect it to anybody? And that's a really important message. Great content is multiplied by the number of people it connects with right? In your target audience. Right. You have the best book in the world, but nobody reads it. It's worth nothing. Mm -hmm. If you've got a following of a hundred thousand people and you write a terrible book and none of them read it or get very far through it, you got nothing. It takes both great content and a collection and an audience. And so one of the first things he did is let's, let's start to see how high a profile of a blog we can get you on. And we looked at the different options and the possibilities. Mm. And I went through kind of a tryout process, right? He was connected to an editor at Forbes in the leadership column. Uh, he's since retired. And I wrote my first post and I got coached on it. Like, okay, is that really tight? And sent it in. And Fred said, sure, that looks great. He put it up as guest post. I did that six times. He liked five of them. And after the fifth one, he was like, you know what? I'm tired of reviewing your articles. You, you know what you're doing. You've got a great lane. It fits. Here's your, here's your column. So I can post whenever I want on there and, and work hard to keep that, that active and live. As soon as I did that, a lot of people in my circle went, wow, Rob, you, you just, like I gained 20, 20 IQ points because mm. I was putting it on Forbes. It creates a presence. I wasn't any smarter than I was before, right? But it creates a presence. And then getting the seven posts up on HBR. So we worked it as part of the campaign. Uh, okay. And then that has been an important pillar of supporting the thought leadership. And all of this has to be well represented on the place that everybody goes when they hear about anything, the web, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to do a lot of work on my website. It wasn't what it needed to be in the beginning. So they think you're good. They've read your article on Forbes. They're coming into your website. Is it delivering the right message to the right way, right? To the right audience. And so all of that is part of being a thought leader. Wow. Uh, great insights. Um, you know, you mentioned that you can, if you don't have a, a following or people that are, are listening already, it's going to be very difficult for that to be put out there in the world. Um, I actually have a social media coach, like, you know, when, um, so I have, I, have, I have a person that runs our social media for our, our businesses. And um, I said, hey, I want to start doing this. I want to start putting some content out there. And, and, and she, has, she has basically mapped out what you have to do. And before, you know, before COVID, you know, all my stuff was private. I, I, I was on LinkedIn, but I wasn't active on LinkedIn because I like the positions that I hold. I'm not looking for jobs. I always thought LinkedIn was where you go and, and when you're looking for a job. Uh, and then I put... Uh, well, I sent, uh, or my buddy shared one of the podcasts with uh, Ron Felice. He's the CEO of Felice Insurance, and uh, he just recently got acquired by AccuSure, um, you know, a, a, one of the largest insurance companies in the country. Nice. And um, 
he put it up there and it got like 3000 views in, in, in a few days. And I'm like, Hey, LinkedIn does this. And he said, yeah, look at it. And I just kept looking at it. I kept, I was like, okay, well maybe I should start doing that because, um, you know, I was only focused on Instagram and Twitter, but you know, you can't get organic reach like that, uh, on those platforms anymore. The only place you can get organic reach is, uh, LinkedIn and TikTok right now. And I'm not getting on TikTok to doing any, any dances anytime soon. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's just interesting that, um, you know, if you, if you want to put stuff out there, you have to get a following and you have to be doing it for a really long time. And, you know, it just gives me, um, you know, hope that it, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not doing this to make any money. I'm doing it because I'm passionate about, it. I get to meet great people like you. And eventually maybe, you know, if, if, if I'm talented enough or the, uh, the, the people that are listening, find the guests that I have on interesting enough, you know, maybe at some point then that transpires or something, but right now it's just a passion that I, enjoy i yeah. really i really love hearing the information that you and all the other guests have because i'm getting the best versions of every every person a lot, a lot of this is selfish for my own you know uh for my own knowledge i want to know what you know and, and these sort of things um you know cannot be quantified because it's just, it's just giving me so much joy and hopefully it's giving other people that are listening out there the same i hope so too it sounds like you you did kind of the same thing you did you, you know you write because you enjoy it and if somebody finds value from it you know great and if they and if you're able to monetize it later on down the road perfect it's a win 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 for everybody in some sense so so what is a consultant or teacher than a learning and teaching machine right mm -hmm. and so interviewing people and finding people that have made really smart moves that's me learning and so it has immediate value because I'm learning and knowing more. And then I'm turning that around and teaching that and sharing that both through my writing and through my coaching and consulting. So it does have immediate value, but it also builds a brand around a thought leader uh, in a certain area. And then that brand helps um, encourage other people to get involved and some small percentage become clients. And so it has both short the reason I'm able to put muscle into it the way I do is it has both short and long-term benefits, right? And, and that is part of the art. And, and many people do what they do for passion as you are. And many of us do it because it's how we develop our business. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've got to be very thoughtful about where you put that energy and how does it all connect, right? Otherwise, you can work for two or three or four years and realize, wow, I never had it connected enough to really work, right? So um, thought leadership done right, powerful. Uh, thought leadership done poorly or without a strategy can suck up a lot of time. Definitely. Uh, I always like to re reverse engineer things. So if I, if I know I want to get to this point <clears throat> uh, in you know, my personal life or uh, professional life, I look at the end goal and say, okay, well, what's going to get me to that end goal? And so everything that I do is going to go towards that end goal. And eventually, you know, there's checkpoints and things like that, just like on a map, you know, okay, we're going to stop here before we go here. And there's kind of checkpoints that you can kind of check in to make sure you're on the right path and, and not going uh, away from where Google Maps or Waze tells you. Exactly. That's so true. <laughs> Um, as we start to wrap it up here, just a little, little bit, uh, just the insight for you, you've got a, you've got a five person dinner party. You're the sixth person. Who are the other five individuals at that table? And what is, what is the reason they would be there? Uh, I would pick five leaders who have led through challenging times. Mm. Um, there is deep gut checks that we all go through, right, as, as, as leaders. And um, it's, it's amazing to get the insights from those people, right? How they managed it, how they sorted through it. Uh, what price did they pay and was it worth it in the end? I, I, think, I think that's who I would, I would have. And who are the five names? If you had, if I had to put you on the spot right now, give me five names. Who would those be? I'm bad at coming up with names. You, you <laughs> have to give me more notice if you want to do that. There's so <laughs> many great leaders that um, it'd be hard to pick. 
Um, but I can I can come back up with that if you want. If you give me a little time to pull my thoughts together. Yeah, I would say um, for for leadership, if I was going to say that, and if I was only going to stay in the leadership category, um, <clears throat> I would I would pick uh, John Wooden, one of the he's the greatest basketball coach of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say uh, Martin Luther King, uh, the adversity that he had to go through. Um, just uh, unparalleled. I can't even imagine some of the things that when you're trying to lead a whole revolution, what that actually does. Um, I would say uh, I'll throw in Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela would be a really good one for sure. To to sit in prison for that many years and come out positive and ready and it's like, wow. um, Luth Bader Ginsburg maybe would be another one. Yeah. You no, know, just leading leading that movement. I don't know who my fifth would be. Um, you got a you got a good fifth one. You no, know, I was trying to think back in time. Um, you know, of leaders. You know, hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Don't have one coming up. But there's been so many challenging times. We always think our current time is the most challenging, right? But right. not necessarily true. So be someone from, from an era way back. I don't have a name for you. Speak, speaking of challenging times, what have you been coaching your uh, CEOs on as far as how, in, how to change and pivot during COVID? It's been, uh, it's been obvious. I mean, the word unprecedented has been used so many times when it comes to COVID, but um, in these unprecedented times, what have you, what have you been able to what, what advice have you been giving? And there's been a lot of great companies that have been able to pivot. You know, if it's a, if it's a food service company, they've been able to, you know, get their staff to understand that, all right, we're going to be a takeout service only. Um, you know, uh, different apps have really thrived. You know, obviously Amazon and some of these tech companies have really thrived. Um, right. But what have you been uh, witnessing on your end? Yeah. And so, you know, our set of clients, few of them have been horribly impacted. The worst of them may be 40, 50% of volume, which is still a pretty big hit, but we don't seem to have a lot of restaurants or some of those groups that were really terribly hit. I think two things come to mind. One is that it steps up the bar for active management leadership. You can't rely on everybody coming into the building and you patting their back and, and seeing them and waving at them. You've got to reach out through the internet, right? And talk to your people at a higher level perhaps manage at a higher level or lead at a higher level to keep the same kind of connectivity. It's different, Um, but it's crucial because it's never going back exactly the way it was. And there's going to be more disparate spread out teams than there have been ever before. I think the other thing is that we have to learn how to make things work with less face-to-face. That's Mm. sales and that's still heavily impacted. We used to go out and see our customers. We can't now. How are we going to connect with them? And using things like Zoom and video technologies as part of it, you and I, you know, real comfortable with that I was doing it beforehand, but you got 60, 70 year old sales guys who are used to getting in their car and driving out and then they're trying to use video. And, and so that's a competency that we have to get better and better at in including engagement, doing offsites on video, using multiple tools. So we've learned a lot through that process, but, um, it's the modern way. And I'm not saying that face-to-face won't be powerful. It might be more powerful, just less frequent in the future, Mm -hmm. but um, you got to get good at connecting this way in in this environment. Those would be two big takeaways. Definitely. Very good advice. I I actually have a a quick, funny story. So um, my wife starts to, uh, she's like, you need to start moisturizing your face. So she, you know, she gives me these products and one of your clients and doing my research is Roden and Fields. And uh, so I use that nightly and that's why my skin is glowing right now. But uh, so, uh, yeah, how did you, how did you, how did you guys come uh, uh, to become, you know, partners? Yeah. So, um, So uh, Lori Bush was the CEO at that time, and she was a member of a group called the Alliance of Chief Executives. Mm -hmm. And I was doing the research for my book. Mm. And and the leader of the Alliance, guy named Paul Whitke, said, you know, you should talk to Lori. She's exceptional. She's doing amazing things over at Rodan and Fields. So I called her up and said, 
or Alliance uh, brothers and sisters, can I come and interview you? And sat down with her and, and she's one of the case studies in the book. Um, and we're having a great conversation and we kind of finished most of the interview and we were talking about the challenges and I said something and she said, wait, I think I need that. Do you, do you offer, you know, is that what you do? And sure enough, that was the first thing I did with Rodan and Fields. And so we worked together for maybe three years uh, as a huge client for us. Um, I wasn't trying to sell her a thing. We just connected through that research. And, um, you know, they grew from, I don't know, 300 million to 500 million during that time. It was a, an incredible growth story. Great people. She's a great leader. She's now retired from, from Rodan and Fields, but um, super powerful. And through the research, we had one other huge client. Again, interviewing somebody, trying to learn what they did that was really smart, lots of stuff, but then they said something. You get that intimacy. And so that slowed down mighty midsize because I ended up with two huge clients, mm. uh, which is happy, happy circumstance. So research is really about making, building relationships and connecting with people and two out of 110 turn into clients. Awesome. Wow. Uh, that's a, that's a really great story. I'm glad I brought it up because I didn't know, I just saw that they were a client, uh, on your, uh, on your website and, um, just a really good backstory along with it. Uh, now, yeah. before, I, before I answer this last question, um, before you answer this last question, you you have to make sure that you can deliver. So if I were to ask you to get another guest to come on this show and share their expertise, who would it be? And before you answer, you have to make, make sure we make that connection. Yeah, and so you know what? I got someone that I think would be awesome. Uh, her name is Megan Patton, mm -hmm. and um, and I think she'd be great. She's got an amazing story, Peace Corps when she was younger in Nepal. Uh, did some consulting. She's one of our one of our principals in our company. Oh, She's okay. amazing with people. Does a lot of emerging leaders coaching. So wow. people who aren't CEOs, but they're coming up in their company. And so she takes, works with them individually and in teams, you know, how do you get, not always a young person, but a person, you know, in the middle management or just getting into management, how yeah. can we get them to move up even faster? What do they need to learn? And um, she's done amazing things. I think she'd be great and she'd love to be on the show. Well, I'd appreciate the connection and she sounds like a terrific, uh, terrific person, just like yourself. I mean, this was, this was really informational. Um, I know that the listeners are going to get so much out of it. You bring so much expertise to the business world and, uh, you know, most importantly, you just, you do it in a, you do it in a non-threatening way that, uh, is easy to, to, to identify with. And that's kind of my style too. I think that's one of the reasons why we hit it off and our conversations are so easy um, because we share that similar demeanor. So really appreciate you for coming on the show. Can you tell everybody to um, <clears throat> tell everybody where they can follow you, follow um, CEO to CEO, just any plugs that you have, your new book, of course, that uh, sure. we'll put out there as well. So, you know, the best place to go is our website, uh, www.ceotoceo.biz. And, uh, and, and, you know, you can go from there. And uh, if you put my name into Google, Robert, share, um, you'll find a lot of hits on me. You'll find the Forbes column and so on. But probably coming straight to the website is the best place to learn more about what we do and how we do it. Beautiful. I'll put that uh, all in the show notes. But thank you so much for joining. Terrific. Chris, thanks for doing this. you got great energy. You're doing a great service to all those people who are learning to grow and develop and uh, love working with you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Buckets podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and share the show with your friends. And until next time, take care.